the hardening divisions between Republicans and Democrats are impacting everything from the economy to infrastructure to voting rights, as we've just been mentioning. George Will, one of the country's most well-known libertarian, conservative journalists, has been following that evolution for decades. And here he is now with our Walter Isaacson discussing his take on the current state of the nation. Thank you, Christian. And George Will, welcome to the show. Glad to be with you. Uh, this week, uh, Congress is debating various voting rights uh, proposals. You called one of them, you called the Democratic pro proposal, the For the People Act, a uh, constitutional desecration. Uh, why, do you, why are you so against it? Well, first of all, the Constitution is fairly clear that the primary responsibility for conducting elections uh, rests with state legislatures. You know, there's no particularly compelling reason to change that. Uh, there is a lot of, I think, synthetic hysteria on the left about the voting bills passed around the country as voter suppression bills. A great many of the measures that are being passed are simply going back to the status quo ante, that is status quo, before the extra measures taken in to liberalize voting procedures because of the pandemic. So there's, as I said, there's a lot of, uh, I think people are more alarmed by the voting bills than there are people reading the voting bills. I noticed when the Major League Baseball uh, decided to move the All-Star game from Atlanta to Denver, uh, I, I predicted to some friends of mine in Major League Baseball that it would take about 10 minutes for journalists to find in Colorado voting provisions that are, are more restrictive, if you will, than the voting provisions, some of the voting provisions in Georgia. And in 10 minutes is about how long it took. Well, you say it's constitutional desecration because some of these bills would uh, determine how states can run elections. But I remember you once wrote that the 1965 Voting Rights Act was one of the noblest and best things Congress had ever done. Uh, wasn't that also determining how elections should be run in states? Sure it was. And it was, it was to uh, address an egregious, century-long, post-Civil War violation of the spirit of the 14th Amendment, and I believe the letter of the 14th Amendment. Uh, that's a very different uh, situation than we are today, which, uh, although uh, advocates of H.R. 1 and, and S. 1 the, the two bills in question here say this is the recur the the resurrection of Jim Crow. That is, as I say, people go from zero to sixty hysteria in about ten minutes in today's uh, political discourse. But do you think that there's been uh, hysteria on the Republican side as well, trying um, to pass these new restrictive uh, laws in state legislatures? Well, first of all. Uh, uh, the use of the word restrictive is, is bothersome. Uh, people say, well, for example, to, to require a, a, a voter ID procedure is restrictive. If so, I think every member of the European Union, say Britain, is restrictive in that regard. I, I think that's just a, a loose way of talking. But yes, my Lord, there's a Niagara of nonsense on the Republican side about voter fraud, of which there's there's vanishingly small evidence, in part because, if you just think about this as an economist would, the effort that has to go into organizing voter fraud uh, on a large scale is disproportionate to any probable uh, electoral outcome. It's just an absurd uh, in theory and non-existent in practice. So yes, there's hysteria all around, but again, what else is new? <laughs> Uh, senator Joe Manchin, uh, who's our great swing senator apparently these days, has a bill this week that tries to compromise on the whole voting issue. And it includes, as you suggested should, some uh, voter ID provisions. It also has voter security. On the other hand, it has uh, more easy uh, ways for people to vote, to register, and to vote early. Do you think that compromise makes sense, and is a compromise possible here? I, I, I think it, it does, and I think it is possible. I, I would quibble with just a little bit. I don't think Manchin is the swing senator. I think there are a whole lot of Democratic senators, half a dozen at least, who are 
prospering in his shadow. That is, they, they agree with him, but they don't want to get out front and center and expose themselves to the abuse from, from progressives. Uh, yes, I, I think a, a compromise is possible on this. You know, almost everything in politics is a realm of splittable differences. How much should we subsidize soybeans? Should we subsidize soybeans? I mean, we can, we can split differences on almost everything, and I would think on, on election procedures as well. The one thing that I think that any voter reform should have in mind is we want decisiveness quickly in our elections. That is, if votes have to be in and tabulated uh, late on election night, because a great nation simply cannot wander along for a week, two weeks, three weeks, while uh, votes are tabulated because it was somehow too much to ask of voters that they get their vote in on time. One of the provisions in Senator Manchin's proposal would try to reduce the amount of gerrymandering, or gerrymandering as it should be pronounced, uh, that's been around for more than 200 years. Uh, does that make sense? Have we gone too far where politicians of both parties are protecting themselves by drawing these weird-looking districts? Yeah, some of the districts look like roadkill uh, splattered all over the map. Uh, uh, there's a phrase in current use that uh, makes me laugh or wince both every time I say partisan gerrymandering. All gerrymandering is inherently partisan. All uh, Both parties do it. Uh, the Supreme Court has correctly thrown up its hands uh, when asked to come up with a, 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 a metric by which we can determine what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, what crosses the line, what line, who drew it, where is it. Uh, now, this, it, it seems to me drawing district lines is one of the spoils of victory, and both parties are going to enjoy their spoils for the foreseeable future because the court will not rescue this. President Trump ran a $1 trillion deficit during a time of full employment. Do you think that Republicans have abandoned the notion of fiscal responsibility more than they should have? <laughs> when did they adhere to it? I, I mean, it's been a very long time. People always say we must not make a fetish of balanced budgets. Good Lord. Uh, that, that ended... Uh, if there was such a fetishization of balanced budget many decades ago. Uh, well, there, there, there are two rules. The first rule of economics is scarcity is real. Therefore, hard choices have to be made. The first rule of politics is ignore the first rule of economics. And both parties subscribe to this. The Democrats now subscribe to monetary theory. They believe it and praise it. Monetary theory says when interest rates are low and are apt to remain low, big asterisk there, uh, a, a nation can borrow uh, without limits, which means spend without limits, as long as the interest rate is lower than the rate of economic growth. Republicans criticize modern monetary theory and practice it also. Uh, there, there is... We talk about the discord in American life, and Lord knows it's real enough but I am much more alarmed by a consensus. It's a consensus uh, as broad as the Republic, as deep as the Grand Canyon. It extends from Elizabeth Warren to Ted Cruz, and it is this. We should have a large, omnipresent, omniprovident welfare state and not pay for it. Everyone's agreed on that. Uh, therefore, both political parties, the political class is more united by its class interest than it is divided by ideology. The class interest is to continue giving the American people a dollar's worth of government goods and services and charging it 80 cents for it. The public loves it. The political class loves it. Everybody loves it except the unconsenting because unborn future generations are going to have to pay for all this part. And so what's our way out of that morass? <laughs> Probably a crisis. Uh, a, a, a general lack, loss of faith in, in the reliability of the American dollar and the government, to, the government's willingness to pay its bills, or alternatively, inflation as a way of slow motion repudiation of debts. That's what inflation actually is. It is repudiation. You pile up debts in, in 2021 dollars, pay them off in 2031 dollars that are worth a lot less. How worried are you about 
K through 12 education, the teaching of various uh, new ways of looking at race in America? Uh, very worried about it. And it seems to me that's the sleeper political issue of 2022 and 2024. Uh, enough parents, I think, are alarmed when their third grader comes home and says they're ashamed of, that their white skin puts them in an oppressor group. I think when their fifth grader comes home and says they've been studying gender fluidity in the fifth grade, I think parents are going to push back. We have a long history in this country, most famously in Dayton, Tennessee, in the Scopes trial, when in fact high school, particularly curricula, becomes a, a political football, a, a, another arena for the culture wars. Do you think, though, that this has been ginned up on both sides, really, trying to push a culture war into the schools, and in fact, it's uh, probably not one of the top 50 problems we face in this country? Uh, I'm, I think it's a, it's a serious problem. It's certainly in the top 50, I can say. It seems to me when you have uh, a concerted effort to convince the rising generation of Americans that their, uh, their nation is defined by a sin, that is, uh, white supremacy and racism, that is an, an important development, to put it mildly, a nation that cannot produce uh, an educated uh, population that rather likes their country and respects it and sees the drama of its, of its attempts to reach a, a more perfect union. That's a serious problem, much bigger, frankly, than most of the problems that, that uh, people argue about. One of the arguments is about whether or not there is systemic racism. Your colleague, Michael Gerson, just wrote a column this week saying from a conservative viewpoint, he really understands the concept that there are things baked into our system that provide headwinds, that are, provide disadvantages to people of color and to blacks. Do you believe there is some racism baked into our system of economy and laws that needs to be addressed? I do not believe that. I, I, I believe that we, the, six, the 65, 64 and 65 Civil Rights Acts, dealing with public accommodations and access to the polls, I think the enormous uh, body of law that has been developed uh, concerning the, uh, e what equality of opportunity means and is still evolving is, a, is addressing the long legacy of slavery. But the idea that, that that is baked into the idea of equity now, that any disparity of social outcome must be, logically must be, is entailed by systemic racism, uh, is an attempt to win an argument by semantic fiat. I, there's far more denunciation of systemic racism than there is defining of that term. But isn't some of the inequity in our society possibly part of uh, a system that still has some legacies of people like yourself and myself and Mike Gerson, who grew up in affluent uh, white neighborhoods and had more advantages? Sure, but that does, I don't see why we should call that racism. Uh, it, it may be a legacy of slavery, but it is not an example of current racism. There is a huge difference. And so how would you redefine it so that we could address it? I wouldn't redefine. I don't think it's a helpful term, and I would uh, stop using it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court has been trying to do a delicate balance between free speech rights, uh, rights of gays and other people, as well as uh, freedom of religion. Uh, they balanced it a bit this past week when it came to uh, a uh, case about foster care and Catholic services. How do you think that balance is, should go? Uh, I, I think there's an enormous amount of bullying now going on uh, over the free exercise of religion. That, that fellow in, at the Masterpiece Bakery in, in Colorado uh, is still being harassed by people who want him uh, to bake cakes that, uh, for occasions that, that violate his sense of religious propriety. Uh, same-sex marriages, whatever. Now, there is no shortage in the Denver area of bakeries willing to bake these cakes. Why don't they just leave the man alone? Uh, the, uh, the rapid, swift, altogether welcome 
triumph of the gay rights movement is in danger of stepping over into now in a kind of aggressive triumphalist bullying on the part of the victors. Uh, gay rights are now firmly in, 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 protected in law, firmly supported by a majority opinion in the United States. Leave the baker alone. Enjoy the fruits of victory. Let's let's everybody calm down and and let that little live and let live spirit, uh, which was originally what the gay rights movement was all about. Uh, the latest affirmative action case that'll probably reach the court. One of them involves Harvard and potential discriminations against uh, Asian Americans because of preferences in the admissions process, or allegedly so, uh, that prefer blacks and other minorities. Why should Harvard be told by the government how to pick and choose the people for the classes it wants to educate? Well, that's a good question, because the court has said that schools have enormous latitude to shape their student bodies for uh, academic reasons that they, they think serve the learning experience. I got that. Uh, during the discovery in the lower courts uh, about this uh, particular case that is winning its way toward the Supreme Court, a document was unearthed from the uh, Harvard Admissions Department that said the following. If admissions were simply by the two objective metrics, that is high school transcripts and standardized tests, uh, the admissions at Harvard would be 40% Asian American and 1% African American. Now, uh, that's not an outcome Harvard wants, and Harvard should be, uh, it seems to me, should enjoy some latitude uh, to prevent that. On the other hand, uh, Harvard, which is, shall we say, friendly to the progressive impulse in the United States, has... Uh, been a cheerleader for a, a central government that fine-tunes the behavior of civil society's institutions in order to bring them into conformity with uh, non-discrimination laws. So Harvard is going to have to find out a way to, to live with the laws that most of us like. George Will, as always, thank you so much for joining us. I've enjoyed it. Let's do it again.